Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Thanksgiving 11 a.m. service. I hope that our Thanksgiving has been a good time for you. For me, it started on Thursday with a bit of a nasty Canadian cold. I, I see more of flu whenever I get them. I, I feel like I can't get over them properly, but I'm glad that I can still be here today. Val, can we get some lights in the auditorium, please? Um, a while ago, my wife and I went to the mall. Now, my wife likes to stop at Winners, if you guys know where that is, because Winners just offer all of these discount things, right? So we always stop there. We go through Winners. She can check out all the specials before we head to the more expensive parts of the mall. So we, we head through Winners. We, don't, we go through Winners. We don't buy anything. We buy some other stuff in the mall, but what I didn't know if you buy anything in the mall that has one of those little magnetic strips to it, and you go out through winner's main doors where they have those burglar alarm thingies, they go off. So we walk out innocently with our packages from other stores, and we go through them, and suddenly the alarms are screaming. And I don't know if this has happened to you, but for a moment, you feel like you've done something wrong. You feel like you might go to jail, right? But immediately, I kind of calmed myself down, and I'm like, oh, it's okay. I know I've paid for the stuff there, so I went to the lady, and I told her, like, this is all our stuff, and she's like, oh, you're good to go, so we left. But it just got me thinking about how this same thing can happen in our spiritual lives, where you can feel, especially if you are a Christian, and maybe you felt this way even if you're not a Christian, that we often feel like we are being accused of something, whether it's right or wrong, but we feel like we're guilty. We feel like there should be some kind of punishment. And today, we are actually going to be talking about this. When this happens in our lives, what is a defense about against it? Because we are currently busy with a series called The Art of War. And if you haven't been to Grace, if this is your first time here, you can catch up on our previous two messages on Spotify, um, iTunes, wherever you listen to podcasts, or on YouTube. But basically, this is what we've said so far. One, there is a spiritual world which we cannot deny. And the Bible talks about it very clearly. The Bible also tells us that we have a real spiritual enemy called the devil that is out to destroy us. And then the second thing you have to understand is whether you want to know it or acknowledge it or not, there is a spiritual war raging around us that's always pulling us in. And as Aragorn told Theoden in The Lord of the Rings, war is upon you whether you would risk it or not. So whether you want to acknowledge it or not, there is a war raging around us. And if we do not prepare for it effectively, we will get hurt in the process. And that is why we are going through this series. In this series, we, don't only, we, didn't, we started by looking at the reality of it, but now we're looking at how we can defend ourselves against different kinds of spiritual attacks that would often injure our souls. And today, our topic is called, Don't Surrender Your Freedom. Don't Surrender Your Freedom. And we're going to read again from Ephesians 6. For the next couple of weeks, for eight weeks, the series is eight weeks long, we are reading from Ephesians 6, and today we're going to be reading 13 again just for context, and then the rest of verse 14. So if you've got your Bibles, you can open to Ephesians 6, but I will also have it on the screen for you. So let's read that together. Ephesians 6. Therefore, since there is a real spiritual war out there, Paul writes to this church in Ephesus, he says, therefore... Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, when the day that you are pulled into the war, when that day comes, that you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. We spoke about that last week. And with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Now, today we're going to talk about this last part, the breastplate of righteousness. And we, we started speaking about the Roman armor last week and how they would first have their undergarments on and then how the, the belt would keep everything together. 
But the breastplate, the main purpose of that, it covers the majority of your body. It covers, it protects your organs. But the interesting thing is, if you are, if one of your organs gets injured, there is still a chance for you to survive, unless it's your heart. The heart is one of our most vulnerable organs, and that was the main organ that was protected by the breastplate, was the heart. And the devil that we learned last week is also called the father of lies. One of his main attacks in the lives of Christian is if, of Christians are coming after our hearts. It is a very specialized attack that we're going to be talking about today. Last week we spoke about how his lies in general affect us, but today we're going to talk about a very specific kind of lie, a lie that tends to pierce our heart. And that lie is the fact that Satan tries to strip us of our sins of righteousness. What is righteousness? The Strong's Dictionary defines it this way. Righteousness means a condition acceptable to God, a right standing before God to be found innocent or to be acquitted of charges. So as Christians, one of the main reasons why we follow Jesus is that we believe that Jesus has paid for our sins, that we are acquitted of charges, that we are free, that we are accepted by God. And one of the ways that the devil wants to attack us, and even if you're not a Christian, he might come after you trying to make you believe that you are not worthy of even other people's love, that you are not worthy to even walk this earth. But if you're a Christian, he will try to pierce your heart by stripping you of your sense of righteousness. And if he can wound your heart, your conscience, deep enough, and you don't deal with it quickly and effectively... Spiritual death can result. And this is one of the main lies of the Satan. Condemnation. And here's how it would often go. He would say something to you like this. You really call yourself a Christian? Look at all the things you've done. Don't you see how often you've failed God? You're a fraud. And I'm thinking back to my illustration that I had at the beginning of walking out of the store with bags and the alarms, go, the alarms go off. And for a moment, I pause and I'm startled a bit, but immediately I remember that everything in these bags were paid for. So I'm actually good. But what happens is when the devil accuses us, when those alarms goes off, he doesn't just falsely accuse us Often his accusations point to things in our past or even our present that is true. So often we carry things in the bags with us that are not great. So often those accusations come from things in our past like dysfunctional families, maybe eating disorders of things that you've struggled with, sexual addictions, addictions to pornography, maybe addictions to drugs or alcohol, maybe gossiping. Maybe another kind of sin. And he will use that and he will use the root of that to say, do you see how bad you actually are? Do you see why you don't deserve to be loved by God? Do you see why you don't deserve to be in the church? Do you see why you deserve to be judged? And it spirals. And then Christians start to walk in guilt and in shame, feeling like failures feeling like we're not worthy to serve God, feeling like we don't deserve His love and His blessings. And here is the first thing that I want you to know today. You have to know this, that the enemy wants you to walk in guilt and shame. The devil wants you to feel like you're not worthy to be loved by God. Because if he can get you to believe that deep enough in your heart, he can cause spiritual death in your life. But before we continue, I want to do a quick reality check. And this might be hard for you to hear, but here's the reality. You and I, even the Pope, no matter who, who it is on earth, we do not deserve God's grace. We do not deserve God's protection. We do not deserve His love. 
we do not deserve his glory because of our brokenness, because of our sin. And the Bible is so clear on this topic in 1 John 1 verse 8 that it says if you claim to be without sin, then you are a liar and the truth is not in you. So here's what it means. If you're sitting here today and you're like, I think I deserve it to an extent because I'm not that bad, then the Bible says, well, then you're actually a liar and then you don't deserve it because you're doing sin by just believing that. Because we're all broken. We all sin. We all do things that God has told us not to do. We all do things that cause harm to each other and that causes harm to our relationship with God. So the way that humans have been trying to fix this and the way that the Jews had to do it before the time of Jesus has always been the same. It was two things. One is you try to earn it by living the correct way. So we try to earn God's love. We try to earn his protection. We try to earn his love by doing the right things. But guess what? We struggle to do the right things. So we keep messing up. And God said, because he's holy and he cannot stand something that is broken and wrong, the penalty for that is death. So what happened was God said, I would accept the death of something else so that you don't have to die for your mistakes. So that's where offerings came in in the Old Testament. So I would make a mistake, and then there was some kind of qualification. There would be a goat or a lamb or a dove that would be sacrificed, and that would pay the price for my mistake. But guys, I don't know about you, but I've said this often. I have made enough mistakes in my life. I've done enough sin in my life that I would slaughter a whole farm full of animals and would probably not be enough. So the reality check is that we do not deserve God's grace. But the beauty is that he gave it anyway in abundance. And I want you to hear from Romans 3 what he says about it. Romans 3 verse 21 to 24. God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, without trying to live perfect without having to make all these sacrifices, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. This is so beautiful. So even when people still tried to earn God's love by keeping the law, God already knew we were going to mess up, and he already had a plan to save us despite our shortcomings. It was prophesied long ago, it says. And here it is, verse 22. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter how many sins you've committed in your life. It doesn't matter how old you are. He says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in His grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. You see, we all fall short. We all mess up. We cannot get away from that. That's the reality check, right? And he tells us in verse 23, everyone has sinned. That's just period. That is what it is. It's echoing our reality check. But the beauty in verse 24 is that you and I, although we're flawed and although we can't save ourselves and although we can't do things perfectly ourselves, it's not up to us because God is the God who takes initiative. God sent Jesus to save us. And the Bible talks about Jesus coming to earth. He's fully God and he comes to earth in the form of man. So while Jesus is on earth, he's both 100% man and 100% God, and that is so confusing. But it's amazing because it means it's a godly thing. It's something we can't do. It's something we can't replicate. It's something we can't fully understand. But you see, he had to be fully man to experience the things we experience, to go through the same temptations, yet he never sinned. But if Jesus was just a man who died on a cross, His death would have only saved another man. But you see, Jesus wasn't just a man. He was God. And therefore, his death was enough to cover every sin of every person in the past and the future. 
And Jesus didn't stay dead after his death, but he was resurrected. So he not only conquered sin, but he conquered death. And that's why I believe in him. And 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with Christ. In Hebrews 9 verse 15, it says Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. He is the mediator, the negotiator of a new promise between us and God that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Jesus takes the initiative. Us being made right with God, us being loved by God, that has nothing to do with us. It is God taking the initiative. The only thing that's required of us, we need to have faith and we need to confess. No matter who we are, He is faithful. Philippians 3 verse 9 says, I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. It doesn't matter how much we've messed up. It doesn't matter how guilty you feel about the stuff you've done. If you have faith in Jesus, and 1 John 1 verse 9 says, if you confess your sin, then he's merciful. Then he just gives it to you for free. That is who he is. And this is what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. No matter what you believe, you always have to live up to a standard. You always have to try to be better in order to be loved by something out there. And if you don't step up to that standard, you will never inherit whatever comes next. But you see, in Christianity, it's not about us being better. It is about God coming to earth and giving it to us for free about God loving us despite our brokenness. The Bible says when we were still enemies of God, if you're not here today, if you're here today and you still don't love Jesus, the Bible defines you as an enemy of God and it says, guess what? He loves you anyway. And you are one of those that is calling to you, to Him. And here is the reality today. Jesus repairs our relationship with God. And no lie, no power, no sin can ever take that away from you. If you believe in Jesus, that is a fact. And if we go back to that illustration at the beginning, when I'm walking out with that bag, no matter what is in that, Jesus has already paid the price for what's in that bag. So when I walk out through those gates, there's no alarms going off. I don't need to feel guilty anymore because if I believe in Him, it has been paid for. But how do I know if Satan is accusing me falsely and that's why my heart is aching so much, that's why I'm doubting, or whether God is convicting me? Because the Bible says that part of the Holy Spirit's role in our life is to convict us of wrongdoing. How do I know the difference? Revelation 12 verse 10 calls the Satan the accuser. See, God convicts us, but he accuses us. And there's a big difference between accusations and conviction. And I think here's three ways that he often accuses us and tries to steal our freedom, tries to pierce our heart. One, and this is the one that I probably struggle with the most in my own life is he encourages us to accuse ourselves. He plants those little seeds in our minds of introspection and memories of past mistakes and feelings where I start to think and I go like, I was so bad. I don't know if God can ever love me. I don't know if I'm worthy to to be in his presence. Not if I think back of everything that I've done. The second way that he accuses us is he uses other people. And it could be 
a real thing that they're bringing to light, or it could be a false accusation. But when people bring things up, and especially if you call yourself a Christian, if they bring something up that's not in line with God, well, like He will try to use it to make you believe that you're not good enough to call yourself a Christian. He will try to convince you that the fact that you're sitting here today and you're still messing up and someone saw that means that you're actually a fraud and you don't belong here. A third way that he does this is he makes you believe that your circumstances are accusing you. And my guess is going to be that for most of you here, especially if you're Canadian, this might be the hardest one for you. Because if there's one thing that I've learned about Canadians over the last three years is that they do not like suffering. This is a pretty easy country to live in. And we don't like suffering. And he will use your pain and your suffering as accusations against you. And you will start to think, if I was just right with God, maybe I wouldn't go through this. God must be punishing me, right? Is that why... Why I have this sickness, or is that why I'm suffering financially? Those are three ways that he accuses us through our own introspection, through other people, and through our circumstances. And if you allow that to spiral in your life, if you allow those arrows to pierce your heart, you will end up being uncertain. You will end up feeling defeated. And you will end up not knowing if God has actually accepted you. And that is not what God wants. And that is not why Jesus died. He did not pay the ultimate price so that Christians still wonder if they deserve God's love. That Christians should still wonder if God has truly adopted them. But how do you know if it's a valid conviction? Here's the difference. If Satan accuses you, it will be in hate. If God convicts you, it will be in love. If Satan accuses you, it will pull you away from God. But if God convicts you, it will draw you nearer to Him. If Satan accuses you, it will lead to depression and to discouragement and uncertainty. But if God convicts you, it will lead to discipline and devotion and certainty. If Satan accuses you, it will make you look back and want to give up. But if God convicts you, it will make you look ahead and have hope. See, the two causes complete opposite trajectories in your life. The purpose of the devil's accusations is to draw you away from God. Or the purpose of Jesus' conviction, the Holy Spirit's conviction in life, is to draw you towards God. And that is what I want to leave you with. As you're thinking about your own mistakes and your own sins and your regrets, figuring out if this is an arrow that's trying to pierce your soul or whether this is God convicting you of something. Remember, Satan's accusations pull you away from God. But God's convictions draw you nearer to Him. And I want to echo what I said last week. That putting on the breastplate of righteousness is not a checklist. It's not a quick prayer that I do in the morning and I say, God, I know I've got, I've got this righteousness and it's in my closet. And then you walk out. Putting on an armor means that you take it and you put it over you. You live in it. And putting on the breastplate of righteousness means that this price that Jesus has paid, the faith that you have put in Him, that you start living in that certainty. So that when the accusations come, that you don't start doubting. You might have that moment that I had when I walked through that alarm and it went off where you're like, oh, did I do something wrong? 
But because you're rooted in the certainty that Jesus has paid the price for you. Because you're rooted in the fact that because you believe in him, you have been accepted as a child of God. You've been made right with God. You are adopted by God. You've got an eternal inheritance. You can shake it off. You can remain standing certain that no power, no evil, no lie can ever separate you from the love of your Father. If you're still having doubts after you've surrendered your life to Jesus, Maybe you haven't put on the breastplate of righteousness yet. Maybe it's still only head knowledge and not something you're living in. And it's time to put it on. And if you're here today and you still haven't accepted Jesus and you still struggle with the sense of, am I a good person or am I a bad person? Maybe it's time for you to surrender your own internal moral fight to a power that's higher than you. Maybe it's time to surrender it to Jesus and find out what freedom actually tastes like. Let me pray for you. Jesus, thank you for your amazing sacrifice on a cross. A sacrifice that cost you everything. That cost you your life so that we could find life in you. Thank you, Jesus, that we're not serving a dead God that was buried. A God whose bones are rotting in a grave. That we serve a God who conquered death. Who rose from that grave on the third day. And who now intercedes on our behalf with the Father. I pray for every Christian listening to this today. Who's still feeling uncertain. Who's still not sure if they are actually loved and accepted by our Father. And I pray God that in these moments. That you will teach them to not make little of your gift of grace, but that they would fully embrace it and live in the freedom that the Bible says that you give to those who believe in you. I pray for those who still don't believe in you, Jesus, and who are still fighting all of these conflicting things in their lives, not knowing if they are okay or not okay. And I pray that in these moments, Jesus, that you would just so clearly knock on the door of their hearts. That they would open up and turn to you. To find freedom in you. To find forgiveness in you. To find hope for a better tomorrow. And certainty for eternal life after this one. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.